My name is Peso Banson and I'm the director at the Transnational Law Institute at King's College London and it's my great pleasure and indeed very big honor today to welcome Professor Wolfgang Streeck who is the former director at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Cologne, Germany. And we are now here on November 8, 2016 in the British Academy where Professor Wolfgang Streeck is a correspondent fellow. He is a very prolific author and very important and influential thinker and among his many writings are two books which I would like to highlight briefly by way of introduction. One is the much acclaimed and very widely internationally discussed book Gekaufte Zeit, which was published in Germany in 2013 and then was translated into several languages, including in 2014 into English and came out in London with Verso uh, under the title Buying Time. That book will feature in our conversation, as will this book that just was released a few weeks ago, How Will Capitalism End? We are very grateful indeed, Professor Strick, that you have agreed to uh, have this conversation. Um, if I may begin with a complicated question, mm -hmm. it's uh, that your book deals, both books now deal with crisis. And from what you analyze, there are crises on different levels. The crisis of, the, of democratic capitalism, the crisis of the capitalist system itself, but also a crisis of how to analyze the current situation. And would you be able to say a little more about what you call this phase that we're entering into now, the lasting interregnum, mm -hmm. the long period of uncertainty? I think we, we have to uh, uh, remember a few uh, historical achievements of, uh, of social theory. Uh, which were, were, were for, forgotten for, for a while. For a while in the 1960s, 1970s, sociology or social theory generally turned functionalist. That is, uh, with the optimistic assumption that there's always an equilibrium point and that if there is a problem, uh, the system somehow heals itself. Now, I, I go back to a more uh, uh, realistic uh, perspective, which is both historical and allows for uh, a historical accident or uh, uh, for disequilibrium, for lasting, uh, uh, lasting crises. So what I try to uh, revive is a theory of crisis, not just as a little circulation in a, a sort of basically uh, um, uh, progress, uh, progressive development, it, it, it could be a disaster, and, and I want to understand uh, this, this better. And the present situation is probably one in which these older theories of crisis uh, make, make sense and, and can be fruitfully applied. You say very early in your new book that this analysis is not concerned so much with solutions, but with a rethinking of how we actually are to understand this current situation. And for that you say it's time to revisit a number of previous theories, approaches and scholars. And why, why do you think it's helpful to go back to scholars that are mainly European and that write about a time several decades ago? Because if you just allow me, yeah. one of the very, very important things that we all have are grateful to you for is the the periods that you describe for the de this development of capitalism in the 20th century. So now in this current phase, how are we to find guidance to go back to an earlier phase and its interpretation? Yeah, that's a long, uh, the, 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 that's a complicated uh, question, but, but to simplify, uh, what we have to learn and what I had to learn was that the uh, 30 years after uh, the end of the Second World War, were an exceptional period of stability in the history of capitalism. Uh, we grew up in this period and we took for uh, granted uh, the fact that uh, somehow uh, capitalism had turned into a wealth production machine to be operated by uh, skilled economists who, who know everything, who know which, which lever to pull and, and where there is no uncertainty left. So John Maynard Keynes even at some stage misunderstood uh, his, his own profession by saying he was waiting for a time when economics would be as simple as dentistry. 
you mm -hmm. have a problem, you go to a dentist, the dentist fixes the tooth and everything is fine. Uh, what, what we learn if we go uh, a little further back is that uh, capitalism or the economy is not, is not a machine, mm -hmm. but it is a site for uh, distributive struggle. Uh, power plays an important part in this. The, the differential distribution of, uh, of resources and, and, and action capacities. Uh, all of these are in the, uh, uh, the, the, neo or the, classical, the neoclassical models, uh, so pretend that uh, uh, all of these are mathematical, mathematically fixed parameters. In, in reality, uh, for 30 years, uh, capital had to sort of behave because the position of of, or, or capitalism was highly contested uh, and uh, coming out of the war as a result of the uh, of the world economic crisis in the 1930s, which could be settled only in the course of the Second World War. Uh, in in the in the 1930s, we, we had three different versions of of uh, industrial society, neither of which was was working well. One one was communism, the other was fascism. The other was Western liberal uh, capitalism, which needed a lot of fixing mm -hmm. in order to in order to survive, and that fixing happened in in the American New Deal and in the afterward in the in the aftermath of the Second World War in the in the shape of uh, a state administered uh, capitalism. But this period came to an end in the 1970s, and my interest is how and why and. And how can we understand this? In my view, we can only understand this by reviving the characters of, uh, of, of economics, uh, uh, the, the realizing that they are not uh, cogs in a, in a complicated machine, but that they are actors with intentions and interests and, and so on, power. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so in other words, the argument would be to go back to a political economy, which uh, which bridges uh, uh, economics on the one hand and social theory on the other hand, no social theory anymore without an understanding of, of capitalism, no economics anymore without an understanding of politics and society. That's a very ambitious yes. project. And in some sense it rings very current and important, but it also rings as if we should have done this a long time ago already. Some of your colleagues, contemporary colleagues right now, they place their emphasis and interest on rethinking the role that the state should play. Yeah. And the state is one of the major culprits in your analysis. So if we do criticize and critically engage with the role that the state has been playing and bringing about financial globalization, then where should we turn? Should we rethink the state then, or should we approach democratic politics differently? I, I would say two things. One is, uh, historically, capitalism was always uh, so deeply uh, in, engaged uh, in, in state structures, mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. They could not be seen separately, because capitalism as, as an economic regime, uh, if it is not embedded in some sort of social rulemaking, uh, it cannot function. So it needs this, uh, both for support and for constraint. And hi historically, historically, there was always a strong sort of host nation or carrier nation of capitalism, from Florence to the Netherlands to England to the United States, which organized the expansionary uh, uh, dynamics of, of capitalism while at the same time protecting uh, uh, important uh, uh, aspects of society from being taken over mm -hmm. by, uh, by the market or by uh, uh, capitalism. That's the one thing. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, you, you say culprit. I'm, I'm not so sure whether this is, act this is the point. The point is that uh, uh, democratic capitalism of the 30 years after the Second uh, uh, World War uh, was organized in a truly dialectical way. Uh, you could accept a capitalist economy only on condition that there was a state that both stabilized it and distributed the, um, uh, the product in a way 
that satisfied aspirations not just of capitalists but also of others. Mind you that the fundamental problem of any capitalist social order is that only a very tiny minority of society owns what is what capitalism is all about, namely capital. Uh, and, and the others sort of have to work hard for these few people to get richer and richer. Now, the, this is an extremely fragile proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, you need all sorts of tools, uh, historically from brute force uh, to today, let's say, advertisement and consumption norms, uh, to get people actually to play that game. And, and in, the, in the period of democratic capitalism, the idea was that through redistrib redistributive politics, you could both uh, create legitimacy for capitalism and make it working, make it work, because uh, this was built on, this, on the Keynesian genius idea of, of John Maynard Keynes that uh, aggregate demand uh, is produced by taking from the rich and giving to the poor. That is the egalitarian element of, of, of capitalism was sort of built into the growth doctrine uh, of, of, these, of these societies. Suddenly, or in, in the 1970s, this sort of withered away. Mm -hmm. and, and then in a process of very complicated struggles, the Keynesian formula was replaced, what I call the Hayekian formula. Mm -hmm. You get growth by taking from the poor and giving to the rich. In terms of work incentives, or you, uh, lower taxation, then they work harder. And at the bottom, you have to take their income away, so they work harder. So you have a double anthropology uh, the, the, these days. Uh, uh, capitalists work harder if, you, if, if profits are higher, workers work harder if wages are lower. And, and both has some sort of em empirical... In, so so in, in this sense, I, I think, uh, uh, yes, the state... Uh, the, but we'll, 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 we'll talk about mm. the causes of this. The state sort of responded uh, to pressures uh, uh, to, for the dissolution of the post-war uh, democratic capitalism regime by trying to strike a balance between uh, legitimacy and, uh, and, and economic growth, which I describe in the book as two different equilibria that mm -hmm. after the 1970s were, were no longer uh, uh, d d aligned. D aligned, yes, yeah. yeah. So then let's try to understand the context in which that happens. So yeah. the 1970s marks a moment in time, but in terms of economic global development, it also marks a time of great shifts that occur. Yeah. And at that moment, we see fundamental changes at the end of the 70s and early 80s. Uh, conservative politics has triumphant entries in, in national governments. Mm. And the, and. Uh, very famously, Thatcher says, you know, what the new Bible is, it's neoliberalism. And likewise, we see elsewhere an abdication of this former mandate that the state will redistribute, that the state yeah. protects its citizens. But the justification for that move has always been that globalization provides no other way. Yeah, gl globalization is, is, uh, 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 is an outcome uh, of a struggle. Uh, the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, remember the strikes in 1968, and which mm. were worldwide. Uh, that was a time when, when capital began to complain about profit squeeze. Uh, profit squeeze is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, as mm. long as uh, uh, capitalism was treated uh, as a sort of social democratic wealth production machine, uh, they were sort of locked into national politics. And in national politics, they were treated like they were milk cows, yeah? uh, which, which, mm. made, which made sense, why not? And, uh, but, but they didn't like it. So in the 1970s, you see uh, beginning uh, uh, movements uh, in, in all capitalist countries, among capitalists, thinking about how do we get out of this strange position that the society believes that we are there to serve their purposes. Mm. Well, I, I call this the milk cows rediscovered that they were basically predators who wanted to go on the hunt. And in the 1970s, yeah, the hunting license, uh, the, the, the hunting license was sort of no longer necessary because they mm. could get out of the cages. That's right. The the international uh, there's a long story about the coincidence of 
uh, American uh, large, large firms having to go out of the United States in order to realize more economies of scale, about um, uh, finance, uh, 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 how, how do you say, the euro dollar mm. thing, uh, new technologies of transportation, they all come together to make possible that the production regimes grow beyond national borders. Uh, that is not surprising in, in itself. It is surprising that it took so long uh, after the Second World War. But, you, but remember that the United States had, had capital export controls well into the 1960s. Uh, the, then the states sort of had to, uh, had to give in. The moment capital becomes mobile across borders, uh, governments can be blackmailed. It's very easy. Mm. Uh, you, you, you can say, I take the capital of this society, out of this society, and, and put it somewhere else. And then the answer is, what do you want us to do uh, for you to leave us, uh, to leave our productive capital in our country? And the answer is, unfortunately, we need a little more profit. And, 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 and so this sort of entire governance regime of the 1960s and early 90s began to crumble mm -hmm. under the pressure of the exit possibilities. That, that became more and more important. Uh, so, so the state's culprits, to an extent, yes, but there was a period when governments seriously believed that by attracting investment capital through incentives of all sorts, they could uh, provide uh, prosperity for their uh, population, not seeing that this uh, bargaining uh, process could continue forever. Mm -hmm. They can ask for more and more and more all the time. And that's what they are doing. That's the same pressure that led to the signing of CETA, not just now. All sorts of other, all sorts of things, like like internet. And then, of course, the United States always conceived of the world as a uh, as an extension of its own domestic uh, political economy. So, so free trade was something which the United States always, uh, since 1945, uh, featured. When the, the, the problem was that at some stage Japanese and Germans became competitive in, in this field and then began a very complicated uh, discussion. But, but essentially I think uh, um, the, 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 the main effect of so-called globalization was that the capacity of states, national states as well as international organizations, to do what the post-war democratic uh, a state was able to do, namely to provide for some sort of redistribution that disappeared. And so after the, the, the 1970s, uh, inequality uh, goes up, mm. or not, at, the, at the latest in the 1980s, everywhere, because the demands that capital can make on a society grow and grow with increasing mobility uh, of, of capital. That's in a nutshell. I, I think the story of these uh, of these decades. So, at the, is it correct then to say that at the center of these developments is the rise of finance, and the what scholars that you cite in your book and also others have called the financialization of the economy, and the financialization of the economy is so dramatic in its impact that it has on how we categorize political agency, the institutional framework that should govern this. One is long departed from the idea that a national government can regulate its economy, because the economy has gone cross borders, but financial flows that cross borders, they seem to present a conundrum that sociologists you know, and spatialization yeah. theorists have been describing. But where, where are we to find tools to to capture finance and the ontology of finance? Yeah, that is uh, uh, absolutely the question. Uh, I think, uh, if, if I want to think constructively about this, not just descriptively and analytically, one would have to think about uh, modern uh, advanced forms of capital controls slowing mm. down the flow of capital. Mm. Uh, uh, generally, uh, the, the, the notion of, of globalization is often presented as something that uh, cannot be undone. I believe that uh, in, in order to restore some sort of democratic control over capitalism, uh, one needs to restore some, uh, let's say, localness uh, to the capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. and, and regaining uh, regaining some 
sort of foothold for this thing mm -hmm. is absolutely central. Now then everybody will say, ah, this is like Stone Age and, and, mm -hmm. and, and you're... No, I think, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in, there's an interesting example, which is, which is Cyprus. Cyprus, for, for two or three years, is under very strict uh, capital flow controls, and they seem to be doing well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, North Cyprus is small, of course, but uh, I, I think the constructive thinking about uh, uh, a redemocratization of the capitalist economy, if that would work at all, would begin with the uh, uh, restoration of more local control over capital and, and production. And, and a word like protectionism or protection should not be uh, discarded immediately. Uh, the role of states indeed is also to protect their citizens mm -hmm. yeah, from uncertainties and, and, and so on. And you see now in what uh, we, we may later uh, uh, touch on, what, what I think is a, is a global crisis of the international state system. Uh, much of this uh, revolves around demands from uh, rising parts of the citizenry to be protected from the effects of internationalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the inability of states to answer constructively uh, to these demands, uh, which results in populist parties, in mm -hmm. a very strange discourse like these people don't understand what the world is like, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and uh, the conflicts over immigration, very important, because immigration also has something to do with globalization and with the opening of borders. People, I would think, political communities cannot live without borders. The question is how the borders are organized, mm -hmm. what gets across, what doesn't, uh, which is a permanent uh, uh, thing to, to discuss. But, but democracy can never have the same scale as a global capitalist economy. It is impossible uh, mm -hmm. to, to do this. So, so in, to the very least, it has to be a strongly federalized structure. With, with lots of local uh, self-governance built into it. If Karl Polanyi were here, then he would say that we might have been speaking just now about the double movement. Yeah. But the question then is where to find even the starting points for this institutional infrastructure. So membership and belonging and voice and agency, these are terms that political philosophers are now pressing with greatest urgency because they say yeah. if your institutional framework has become so eroded yeah. and there's so much public distrust, then we have to try to revive it. But if we don't know, even after what you call in your book the watershed of the global financial yeah. crisis, and we now a few years later still don't have a global financial infrastructure yeah. that looks for, for the protection of vulnerable constituencies, then of course it's no surprise that people lose yeah. faith. Would you mind if we brought somebody to the discussion that um, I think might have something to contribute here, but we might need to update her a little. So Hannah, Hannah Arendt, she focuses on one of the categories that I think has a lot of currency now. She focuses on work and she describes work-labor action in order to yeah. think of the core, maybe the core member of a democratic society that is maybe the representative of what you say. We study society as a capitalist society and not always try to add it as an outside feature that the economy comes to the society. But we, yeah. And so if she focuses on work and we see now that that revival of labor law happens in a time where workers are worse off than ever before, but there's more and more now more and more attempts now to revive mm -hmm. critical thinking about labor law. Mm -hmm. Do you think that work and a focus on work and its transformation is a viable way to perhaps provide a counterbalance to this discourse on finance? The, what I see more to be more uh, realistic is the possibility that uh, uh, financialization uh, puts more and more people out of work 
uh, and and that an increasing uh, number of people in, in also also new new technology like artificial in, in intelligence mm -hmm. and that and that that gets me to a sort of general point that I make in many of these things the absence of a uh, of, of agency being able to deal with this now uh, uh, labor uh, law theory is not agency. It's sort of we are thinking about something. Yeah, it, in order to be uh, relevant, uh, we need trade unions. We need states that are able to to act. And where are they? Uh, the, the, I, I give you an example. Mm. Uh, when when I worked in industrial uh, as an industrial sociologist in the 1980s, we studied. Uh, the introduction of the so-called CNC uh, m m machinery, which was computerized uh, uh, metal cutting, yeah, and so you could stick a program into the machine, and and it would do the most amazing cuts, and which you would never be able to do by hand in the traditional traditional way, and the fear was that this would result in uh, mass unemployment among uh, very skilled uh, metal workers. Yeah. Uh, this did not happen. Uh, it happened only in the United States. It didn't happen in, Ge in Germany and Japan. And the explanation was, first of all, you had relatively strong trade unions sec that could push for the new machinery being used for purposes that still required skilled labor, that ever more, for example, debugging of programs uh, direct at the, directly at the workstation. And, and so this, uh, this, but this required trade unions and a social security system that absorbed those that were still made redundant and gave them an opportunity for the rest of their, of their working lives uh, to, to lead a decent life. Now, if you think about what may be coming in terms of artificial intelligence, that would repeat itself in the middle class uh, among those people uh, who were ideal, typically speaking, the children of the metal workers that were not really uh, 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 displaced because of strong social protection. But this uh, new generation has no strong social protection and nor is it, is it, it, it isn't even all, uh, uh, employed yet. So they are going to university and they pass university and in 10 years maybe uh, law uh, law firms will have only one tenth of their present employment because the rest is done by very intelligent machines. Mm. Yeah. So so now uh, I think we 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 may lack the political institutional capacity to deal with technological change in a constructive way, in the same way in which the United States lacked it already in the 1980s. When, when, with the advance of CNC, the deindustrialization basically of the United States began. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in other words, agency is, is the important thing. Uh, the thinking about new rule systems comes all, almost automatically if you have the capacity to actually do something for it. So that sounds as if you propagate that the nation state just has to come to its senses and re-engage in providing this institutional protection system. In, but yeah, let, let, let me say that uh, the, I think there is a margin here where the, 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 the self-disempowerment of national politics has gone too far. And we see this in debates on CETA mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. So there is a margin there where one can uh, recover some sort of the action capacity. But that does not, that is not, I don't want to be a solutionist, and mm. I think I cannot yes. be a solutionist. What, what I uh, would add to this is more from, from an observer's position. What we see now is a very uh, sort of deep debate on the right scale of political rule, by, by, which, for, by which I mean mm. this. Uh, Sometimes it is said that you need larger units in order for, uh, let's say, governance to recover its power uh, in relation to the capitalist economy. Sometimes we say we need smaller units. 
So the Scots, for example, are of the view that they need a subnational unit, like the Catalans. Uh, or the, the Danish are very happy uh, about being small uh, the, and not being in monetary union. Whereas others believe that a very large currency like the euro will be uh, more advantageous because it can confront the dollar and it can confront the renminbi or whatever the name of the, of the Chinese uh, currency is. Uh, I think this is an unresolved problem because the problem is so big. But, but there is a lot of struggle going on these days, if you look at, if you look at it, between uh, advocates of small size carving, uh, to carve out, to use the tools of the traditional Westphalian state to carve out a niche for a local, uh, you can also say regional economy in the global world, and alternatively to merge uh, uh, small units into larger units that are more powerful and have more, don't have all their eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an undecided, uh, uh, an undecided uh, struggle. But, but it is definitely going on. And, and Brexit is also part of this. Mm. Uh, the, the British at, at some stage decided uh, that they are better off if they are not part of a larger uh, unit. But lots of people in Britain believe that this is not true. Mm. Whereas the Scots think they are better off if they are not part of Britain, but at the same time part of European Monetary Union. A lot of confusion. Uh, because it's a completely open uh, uh, situation that we hadn't, hadn't had li like, like this. That, I mean, for example, international... Uh, I, I, would, I would say, after 1945, the idea of a global system of sovereign states uh, open to uh, modernization, economic development, that was for the first time. Uh, really uh, uh, instituted. And now you see how this global regime is beginning to crumble. Failed states, uh, the number is becoming higher and higher. The, uh, the one uh, global uh, disciplinarian, the Soviet Union, disappeared. The other one doesn't know what to do, is losing one war after the, after the other. And in between is Europe, totally confused. What is good for what is good for us being one unit or being uh, I don't know twenty eight or even more units? Yeah. In that sense, from an observer's position, I would say the very uh, idea of statehood is, is being uh, is being discussed, and how uh, state how states as political entities should relate to this global uh, capitalist economy, which is now especially in the financial sector just an N equal one. Mm. Yeah. It's more than only intuition why I like that you say let's not try to be solutionists. That's, I think that's a very important point. But at the same time we are of course operating now with the ever more finely distilled types of analysis that you are, um, for example, developing. They have a hard time to develop a loud voice against very, very simple black and white discourses. And we'll see a tragic, hopefully not tragic example tonight, no later tonight, what will happen, where the polls have become so radically polarized now and simplified. But maybe to, to revisit one of these larger conceptual points, that is that there is a need to think society as a capitalist society and to connect that with searches for political agency. You are maybe not just skeptical, but maybe a sort of disillusioned um, fan of varieties of capitalism. Now, many, many um, scholars in economics, in corporate law, in sociology, they don't even know that varieties of capitalism happened. And that is for people like you probably yeah. incomprehensible because yeah. it was a very, very important development. But why, why do you think it has petered out? Because that was, I mean, I, I, at that time I studied yeah. corporate law and I was yeah. in disbelief that people in that field knew more about corporate law, its history, its institutional um, infrastructure than anybody else. 
in corporate law didn't even know this analysis existed. They they failed. They talked about convergence yeah. of corporate yeah. law, yeah. but had no idea about this yeah. Yeah. Anal analysis. Yeah. But but the, the concept of convergence is very important here. Um, the, the comparing uh, units uh, presupposes that these units are independent. Yeah. Uh, now, for some uh, for some time, you could uh, in sort of comparative law, Rechtsvergleichung, mm. yeah, you would say, ah, it's like this here, and it's like this there, and so on. But, but uh, as the world integrates, uh, a, very, a process of convergence not only happens, but can only be man also be manufactured. Uh, in corporate law, uh, you know that uh, the United States and United States law firms and British law mm. firms Sort of have long begun uh, to ensure that their uh, legal code mm. becomes the legal code of the world, yeah, and that makes sense because you need some sort of standardization. Uh, if, uh, that, but but then, the degree to which national systems are different may decline uh, with the independence uh, of of these systems. They are no longer independent. The, the, there there may still be variation. But that variation then is sort of a local, uh, a local modification of a general uh, a pattern. It's like a uh, like an uh, embellishment on, on the surface. Yeah. Uh, the the same is true in or in my view even more uh, Im important uh, in in uh, industrial structures. So t take a place like Sweden or Denmark, the, the happy places uh, in the world these days. Uh, they are small. So if you look at Sweden uh, uh, exporting expertise, uh, engineering, uh, consulting services, and, and this sort of thing, highly skilled uh, 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 workforce, then, then these could not exist without uh, uh, customers all over the world mm -hmm. buying these particular services. They are part of a, of, of a global division of labor and they are lucky to have attracted uh, uh, sort of profitable uh, uh, sectors uh, on their territory. That looks like a state. But, but if the demand, the external demand for these services would disappear, let's say, in China or in the United States, they would suffer enormously. Yeah? The, the, the same for, for Germany. The, the International Division of Labor has progressed to a point where 70% of the cars that are being built in Germany are being exported to, to other places. Yeah? Germany is now has 4.5% unemployment, it's unbelievable. They are sort of the, the, one of the mm -hmm. richest countries in the world. Why? Because they happen to be located in a particular niche of a larger whole of which they are part. And their future is not no longer their own future. It is the future mm -hmm. uh, of a country that performs a particular function in, in a global context. Yeah? In, in this sense, I, w I, I would say, uh, varieties of capitalism has to be seen uh, also in terms of interdependence of capitalisms and then uh, maybe as simply a subsection uh, of a global structure which is called the global capitalist economy. Yes, but I think that some of the drivers for a defense of Rhineish capitalism yeah. and for a coordinated market system were not to, maybe there was some stubbornness and, and a hope that we could preserve the yeah. nation state to continue a form of embedded liberalism. But there was also the recognition that a lot of the rules that were converging are those rules that states have abdicated. Yeah. They are part of a rulemaking system that has become privatized. Yeah. And political agency was given away to hedge funds that yeah. say what kind of corporate law rules they want. Absolutely. And so in some sense, maybe the tragedy is of such a sophisticated political economy analysis that it didn't not yet know how to engage with rules that are produced outside of yeah. this traditional state law system. Yeah. But those rules are ubiquitous now and they make it even more important to find out what the 
the system could be of political agency. And that's why I brought up labor law earlier, because labor law, from what I understand, is now no longer just found in unions. It's true that union numbers decline, but the labor law conflicts around terrible damages in supply yeah. chains, in Rana Plaza, yeah, in Foxconn, yeah, yeah. the labor law that's being created there is understood not just as labor law, it's understood as political agency yeah, yeah, yeah. in order to say we are not part of this, yeah. of the elite that governs, that makes decisions. Yeah, global, global governance, uh, I think, is the concept here. Uh, very often, sort of, without states or uh, through sort of private uh, uh, civil society organizations and so on. My reading of this literature is that, that these efforts are basically uh, uniquely in, ineffective. Uh, so so there, there's lots of goodwill going on, uh, but uh, uh, the Chinese factories cannot be regulated from, from outside China. Hmm. Yeah. Even along the supply chains, you, you do uh, you do a little thing here and there, and and that's it. So so uh, uh, the, the, there is a lot a long literature that is euphoric about the possibility of creating uh, let's say global expert communities that then set uh, rules for particular sectors. Uh, it could be law firms. It it, it could be it could be. Uh, uh, civil society uh, uh, organizations, non-governmental organizations, and so on. But if you look at what they achieve, uh, there there is something to the uh, uh, monopoly of force that that states uh, have. And if you have bodies that do not uh, uh, that rely on more or less voluntary compliance, you see that the rules get softer. Mm. In that sense, I'm a realist, so to speak. And, and, and not uh, not very optimistic uh, that we already have found a replacement for the uh, traditional state at the global hmm. level. Hmm. So let's return to the point where you said about yourself that you are you're not interested and eager to provide solutions because that would not be the right approach, but rather to think about the terminologies and the approaches that yeah. we now are exploring. Now, you feel being sociology with political economy, sociology and political economy, what's the role that this, those are the you know, concluding chapters in your book, what's the mandate, the mission? It generally is the question of what is the mission of intellectuals in a world of uncertainty and, uh, and declining collective action capacity. Yeah? Uh, the, the, our or many of us still live in a world that needed uh, what Gramsci called uh, organic intellectuals. That is where there were uh, states, political parties, trade unions uh, that played a role in a society and needed uh, some sort of uh, advice, uh, knowledge, uh, what the society was was like, what was going on, so that they could act better in, in this context. And uh, to, today, as you as you uh, as one one can uh, observe, uh, um, these uh, counter uh, forces, counter movements to the capitalist economy are very weak, and they are very often powerless. And and the role of organic intellectuals in them. Uh, is very very limited. Also, their reliance on them. So, so today we speak to a more diffuse uh, public, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know whether we only speak to ourselves, to our colleagues, or whether anyone is really is really listening. The the hope is uh, that uh, the universities can be preserved as places where you can open up questions that are not being discussed in public uh, in the hope that this will sort of filter out of the university into a more public discourse. For this one needs to defend not only academic freedom but also a curricula uh, that allow for a deeper reflection than uh, on what you need for your next exam. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
the, the final chapter of, uh, of John Maynard Keynes' uh, general theory is on exactly that, mm. that question. Yeah? If I may remind you, uh, in this chapter he says, uh, every uh, practical man is basically dependent on some sort of scribbler uh, uh, that he has read uh, in his 20s. And then for the next 20 years, this is, he will not learn anything else. Uh, this is his, his book of, of, of recipes. And then he says, uh, I cannot hope that my ideas will affect those that are now in power, but those that I teach at the university, uh, maybe in 20 years, uh, they will build on this. The only question is, do we have in, uh, as much time as Keynes thought he, he had? Can we wait for 20 years until uh, uh, what we now discuss uh, uh, may have some practical relevance? So I'm very uh, uh, pessimistic uh, about this as well. And for the next time, for the next decade or two decades, I think we're dealing with an extremely uncertain world, with a world with lots of surprises, with bubbles blowing up, with uh, strangest things happening. Yeah? I call this an interregnum. Mm. And by uh, quoting Gramsci, an interregnum is a period in which the old world uh, uh, is dying, but the new world cannot yet be born. And then he adds the sentence, uh, and this is a time in which the most bizarre things uh, can, can happen. Tonight we see a bizarre event in the United States, mm. uh, and, and it's only, I think it's only the beginning. I know we could end here, but let me allow, <laughs> please allow me one last question. Yeah. Which is, because if, if we just ended on uncertainty, yeah. then... It would be too uncertain. Yeah. So there are so many and ever faster repeating instances now of whether it's 99% or it's Occupy or even the different voices that now have come to the fore after the vote of 23rd of June. What, what are we to make of those mm -hmm. if they're not yet institutionalized, mm -hmm. you know, if they're not yet part of a revived nation-state theory? They still... I think they speak very loudly yeah. to new forms of being upset and expressing, expressing yeah. that. Yeah, I, I, the, the small correction, uh, revived nation state, I, I said that there is some, uh, some place there to reinforce national governance, but it will not solve the entire problem. Mm. Uh, so so more, uh, much, much more is, 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 is required. So, in my book, uh, Buying Time, uh, I get back to an uh, e economist of the interwar period, uh, Michal uh, Kaletsky, who discusses the question uh, why, uh, how uh, capitalists exercise uh, influence, uh, disproportionate influence, uh, in a democratic uh, society. And his answer is, that they do this simply by expressing discontent. They simply say, uh, uh, we, we don't feel good here. Uh, it's, it's so, uh, the, the, all sorts of things can happen. We won't invest, we sit on our... Uh, and then, you, then you get unemployment and the government... Does. So this, ex uh, this, this expression, not very uh, elaborate, this expression of, of discontent, uh, governments are very carefully listening are capitalists happy? If not, oh my God, we need to do something for them. My idea for a short-term program of reviving uh, democracy is that uh, people manage to exercise the same sort of pressure on governments, just to balance it, so that they express their discontent. Mm. And expressing discontent means you have to be seen somewhere. Unlike capitalists, they don't have to go to the streets, they just don't invest. Whereas we have to find an equivalent for this. Yeah? Uh, then it could be that uh, the technocrats or the politicians that are running our political economy 
will be forced to think uh, if they do something uh, whether this will result in serious discontent on the part of the people. So we restore a second channel, so to speak, not just the channel from, uh, from capital to the central bank, but also the channel from the people to the government. Uh, and for this, a lot of uh, spontaneous, emotional, uh, uh, disorganized maybe action can really help. I, I think in that sense, uh, when I say solutionism is, is not the answer, we will not impress our governments by offering them elaborate plans how to protect uh, the workers in the, in the Midwest. They don't care. Uh, this carries no weight. But if they see people all the time getting, uh, uh, getting restive, that may uh, uh, register, mm -hmm. that may be a signal. Yeah. And and then my sort of short-term democratic uh, um, uh, hope would be that governments would at least be forced to listen with the same uh, with the same uh, attention uh, to the streets as they do to the uh, stock exchanges. Well, there is no better ending. <laughs> Thank you so much. For your time. Good. <laughs>